uh, these few days to hang out with you great folks and talk about uh, interesting and important matters. Uh, let me get right to it. Uh, I contend that the evangelical debate about annihilationism has not been properly theological. Now certainly a great deal of attention has been given to exegesis, which is of course of the utmost importance. But sometimes we seem to forget that doing exegesis without a theological framework is impossible. Indeed, the hermeneutical spiral is unavoidable, where we have a pre-understanding of theological constructs that enable us to understand a text, and that which then the text speaks to and shapes our theological constructs in a, in a spiral sort of fashion. No one just comes to a text and reads it like a blank slate. That's not how interpretation works. Uh, but further, this lack of theological engagement, engagement excuse me, has created a bit of a logjam, perhaps, in the discussion. So perhaps a theologian can speak up and bring some clarity. Well, I'll give it a go today and do my best. Now, exegesis is usually not very straightforward. It's not easy. It's not obvious most of the time. Um, even those of us who wish to faithfully hear, understand, and obey the gospel, sometimes we disagree about our interpretations. That's sort of uh, what's going on here with this particular issue. And I'm, you know, very much aware that I'm in a room where most of you have a certain view and you consider that to be the biblical one, right? But I also don't need to tell you that it's not hard to go into some other room where you can find a group of people who consider a different view the biblical one. Um, you know, simply using that label doesn't really get us far. Uh, it seems like the views on hand have at least some degree of exegetical plausibility. I mean, no one's saying ridiculous things, no one's dismissing the Bible. It seems to me that uh, with all the exegetical debates going on, and again, they're very important, it, it's not obvious to me that someone is uh, saying implausible things. So at this point, if you have two sides in a, in a debate that have some degree of plausibility, that aren't laughable, uh, and they're sort of at a logjam, what you can then do, it, it can be helpful to turn to systematic theology. Ask yourself, what effects would this particular view have on other Christian doctrines? That might shape our exegesis, or at least inform how we might proceed forward. So with that in mind, I want to raise a theological problem for any view that posits the cessation of existence of those condemned to eternal punishment. Now for that view, I'm going to use the word annihilationism. I know you guys uh, are rebranding. <laughs> I heard about that yesterday, and that's interesting. Uh, apologies, I don't mean anything specific with the term annihilationism. It just happens to be what's on my sheet of paper, and that's what I'm going to read. If you could replace every instance of the word annihilationism with conditionalism or whatever your new brand is going to be, it wouldn't change my paper at all. So apologies, just bear with me there. I will suggest that annihilationism has some problems of incompatibility with Chalcedonian Christology. Now this basic argument's not new to me, it's not one that I entirely came up with. But I've broadened it a bit, uh, I've broadened it to cover the major atonement models, not just penal substitution. I I've done my best to refine it a little bit, and I will suggest that it hasn't yet been adequately refuted. Now, if I'm right that annihilationism requires us to adjust our Christology in, in important ways, or the atonement in important ways, if it's going to be coherently integrated into Christian theology, well, that is a significant point when it comes back to judging between two exegetical programs that have some degree of plausibility. Because again, exegesis is never really all that obvious. So then, on to it. I'll present the argument and then I'm going to work through each of the premises. Uh, you have that in front of you, so um, it'll help hopefully keep us track with what um, could become a little complicated, but I'll do my best to keep it clear. Uh, point A, premise A. The annihilationist must say that death is ultimately and characteristically non-existence. I'll ex explain each of these in just a moment. Uh, premise B. Christ's death was of the same essential nature as that which comes to man in his fallen state. Point C. Annihilationism must say that Christ ceased to exist in his death. This flows from point A and point B together. Uh, point D. Annihilationism must say that Christ ceased to exist in both his human and divine nature, in his divine but not his human nature, or in his human nature but not in his divine. Simple disjunctive. Uh, Christ could not have ceased to exist in both his human nature and divine natures, or in his divine nature, but not his human nature. Premise F. Christ could not have ceased to exist in his human nature, but not in his divine. 
Conclusion, therefore, annihilationism is false. So let's begin with premise A, because I know I need to unpack each one of these. Uh, let's begin with premise A. This sort of seems to flow out of annihilationist exegesis. So to explain this premise before I get into that, uh, allow me to briefly contrast annihilationism and traditionalism on the nature of death. Annihilationists consider the Bible's primary sense of death to be what they deem to be the most, quote, natural or most, quote, common sense notion. Death is ultimately and characteristically non-existence. In a representative statement, Edward Fudge writes, quote, The most natural opposite of life is death or non-life. It is not life in misery. If ordinary life stands over against death, can the opposite of eternal life be any less drastic? End quote. Other annihilationists frequently make similar statements. I've, I've, as one who does a, a PhD on these sorts of things, I've had to read a great deal of them. And I've enjoyed uh, the literature, but I, I've found this over and over in Froome and Gillibard. Like, these statements are not difficult to find. And so it seems that the force of the annihilationist exegesis would be undercut if this point were not insisted upon. That it carries significant theological weight in their position seems clear enough. And so, it, at least to me, it becomes difficult to see how any position could be annihilationism or anything remotely similar without this commitment in point A. Uh, traditionalists, by way of comparison, uh, tend to, to see what might be called physical death and spiritual death as interconnected. Physical death, the cessation of biological life, is really theologically inadequate in and of itself to account for all of the biblical statements about death, as uh, we heard last night in the, in the session, and I think that that's exactly right. It cannot be the whole story, although it's often an inextricable overtone. For many, if not most traditionalists, death in scripture is primarily about subjective alienation and separation from God's blessings. Death in this perspective incorporates not only the eventual loss of biological life, but also, most importantly, the loss of spiritual vitality that comes from a proper orientation and relationship to God. Traditionalists point out that notions of life and death in the Bible seem to have little concern for the question of existence versus non-existence. Premise A. Premise B. Premise B says that Christ's death was the same, at our, same as ours. Now, this is an important one, so I'm going to spend a bit of time on it. Many passages are relevant to support this premise, but for the sake of our time limitations, I'll limit myself to Hebrews chapter 2. In this passage, the author of Hebrews, sorry, the author of Hebrews argues that for Christ to be humanity's great high priest and to make atonement for sin, Christ had to assume the same human nature he intended to redeem sharing in the conditions inseparable from ours. This passage provides substantial for support for premise B. In verse 9, Christ assumed flesh so that he might taste death for everyone. Now this is a really interesting phrase for our present purposes. This concept of tasting death really cannot refer to, refer to the shortness of time between his death and resurrection, in the sense that he merely tasted death by being dead for just three days. Commentators say the phrase has the extended meaning of come to know or to experience. Nowhere, including here in Hebrews 2, is it suggested that Jesus only tasted death or merely tasted death. This phrase is used to indicate a matter of experience, not to suggest the superficiality of that experience. And so we say Christ experienced death to the full. Uh, again, in verse 11, Jesus and those he consecrates both share a common humanity. Verse 14, Christ himself partook of the same flesh and blood as those he sanctifies, where both of these words describe a full participation in that shared reality. Christ fully participated in human nature, explicitly for the purpose of dying so as to conquer death for us all. We all say amen. In order to accomplish redemption, he must have complete solidarity with his brothers and sisters. This solidarity required that he take on the mode of existence that is common to all humanity. So it seems, then, that this passage implies premise B. Christ's death, it's hard to see how it could be lesser or fundamentally different than what our death would be. By the logic of this passage, his humanity, and by implication, his human death, seem to require the basic idea that his death was of the same nature as that which comes to everyone in the human race. Verse 17, 
Christ had to be made like his brothers in every respect. He could only be our great high priest if he became like us completely in every way except in committing sin. This likeness is not partial or superficial, but it's one that's realized by full participation in solidarity, and so it's hard to imagine that his death would be so different from ours so as to make premise B false. The argument seems clear enough. A high priest must self-identify and act on behalf of those he represents, and a death other than a full human death would seemingly disqualify Jesus for this role. So in sum, on uh, the incarnation on premise B, in sum, Christ's victory over death was not won by evading the full weight of death, but by taking on its fullness only to emerge victorious over it. His was not a partial death or a light death. You know, in today's age of marketing and diet fads, we might say his was not a death light. Whatever death is and all that it entails, Christ took that upon himself taking the full sting of death to provide a way for us to escape death's sting. His cannot be the stingless death of the saints because his death provides the foundation and possibility for that. Now, I belabor the point, but it'll become important in a minute. Let's then pause to note that if premise B is true, then there are some important implications for the atonement. Uh, the various views out there of the atonement, penal substitution, Christus Victor, the satisfaction view, etc., all of those, uh, they all agree that the role played by Christ's death is crucial. So now I'll take just a little bit of time to treat some of the various models of the atonement, showing how they each support premise B. The first model I'd like to talk about today is penal substitution. Now, I, I think it's fair to say that many or even most annihilationists hold this view, and so it probably deserves the most of our attention when we talk about atonement theories. Roughly, penal substitution says that in love, Jesus Christ became our substitute, living a life in our stead and fulfilling the law and dying a death that bore the just penalty for our sins. Okay, what does the death of Christ mean in penal substitution? Christ's death is vicarious punishment. He experienced the penalty for sin that was due to us, and this includes death. It supports premise B in that it insists Christ's experiences of death was essentially like ours would be because it really was ours forensically. He experienced the penalty of the fullness of death. The traditional view of eternal punishment fully recognizes that Christ did not die everlastingly or experience death forever. His limited time of dying on the cross and entering into death for three Jewish days has been raised as a problem by the annihilationist against traditionalism. How can a hell, sorry, how can hell be everlasting conscious torment if Christ drank the full cup of God's wrath for sin, yet paid the penalty of hell for just a weekend? Is not the penalty of hell everlasting? Well, this is a problem. One answer to this problem lies in the concept of equivalence. Given his innocence, and given the hypostatic union that makes the person of Jesus Christ of limited, limitless worth on account of being divine as well as human, the penal suffering incurred by Christ is equivalent to that of those redeemed from a spiritual death, which would have otherwise been made permanent in the eschaton. Both of these are limitless. His is limitless on account of his limitless worth. Theirs, if realized, would be limitless on account of its everlasting duration. It is not everlasting duration, punishment per se that divine justice requires, but rather punishment that rightly corresponds to the limitless value of God. This, save for the exception of the God-man, seemingly can only be achieved by everlasting punishment, eternal death. In the case of the God-man, it's achieved by experiencing the essential penal nature of death in all its fullness, although not an everlasting duration. So despite the difference, equivalence is achieved and the essential character of death is fully experienced in both situations. This is a very common answer and an attractive one. But importantly, the annihilationist has the same problem, but it seems that she cannot appeal to equivalence to resolve it. Uh, the view insists that hell is eternal in effect, not in duration. Yet Jesus' death was not eternal in effect. It famously failed to be permanent, a fact on which the whole of the Christian faith hinges, of course. The annihilationist demands the, that eternal punishment must be understood as permanent non-existence, since that is the fullness of death. So neither annihilationism nor traditionalism, 
when combined with penal substitution, can say that Christ experienced exactly everything that the reprobate will in hell. And since this is true of neither side, neither side can claim that fact per se as a fault of the other. Both make an appeal to equivalence. However, does that really work on annihilationism? It's difficult to see how. Annihilationism cannot rightly claim equivalence between eternal punishment and Christ's suffering and death. Annihilationists insist that eternal punishment is characterized by permanent non-existence, death as they would understand it. And it's very difficult to see how Christ's death could be sufficiently of the same essential nature to maintain consistency with penal substitution. That was dense. Let me try to explain that using uh, what Edward Fudge has written. He has a section titled, quote, Calvary, Calvary Reveals God's Final Judgment, uh, end quote, soon followed by a section titled, quote, Jesus died the sinner's own death, end quote. He plainly says, quote, Jesus not only died for our sin, he died the death he would have had, sorry, he died the death that we would have had to die if he had not taken our place and died in our stead. Fudge recognizes that the curse of death is sin, and for him, non-existence forever, and that this didn't happen to Jesus. He makes an appeal to the dual natures of Christ. His death would have been permanent non-existence were he not also divine. Instead, just the human nature ceased to exist. So here it's worth quoting his comments at length. Quote, Some protest that Christ's death was not a true pattern of the judgment awaiting sinners in hell, since Jesus was an infinite person and could absorb infinite punishment in a single moment. Finite sinners, this argument goes, will require conscious punishment in infinite duration for justice to have its way. The whole logic of finite and infinite punishment in victims is totally without biblical basis, instead springing from medieval speculation grounded in feudalistic canons of justice. More than that, this philosophy itself leaves little room for the question whether the infinite punishment of hell might not be defined in some terms other than the conscious torment for endless time. If death is seen to be destruction without limitation, which the traditional view has not allowed, then is not penal death itself an infinite punishment, especially if it is an internal death which is forever irreversible? End quote. Fudge writes. I find at least four difficulties with Fudge's handling of this issue. First, I don't quite see him addressing the main point about equivalence. The issue is not that Jesus was an infinite person. The issue is that Jesus, as fully divine, was a person of limitless value and worth. It's not an appeal to his omnipotence in enduring punishment. It's an appeal to equivalence that requires limitlessness. Only such a person could satisfy the demands of justice for the multitude of the redeemed, which require a limitless punishment. Second, his dismissal of the equivalence is a bit surprising because his own position also, see, also seems to require some account of equivalence. In Fudge's view, death is supposedly limitless punishment in that, is it, in that it is eternal in its effects. Only a God-man could satisfy the demands of justice that stem from a victim of limitless worth being wronged. Now, this is in no way merely bound to, quote, medieval speculation grounded in feudalistic canons of justice, end quote, as a careful reading of Anselm would demonstrate, I contend. Third, while I'm unable to flesh this point out here, it seems to me that the idea against that sin against the God of limitless worth requires limitless punishment, that idea is veiled behind most every passage about judgment, wrath, and punishment, and therefore contrafudge has substantial biblical warrant. Fourth, Fudge goes on to seemingly concede the point on equivalence. He suggests that permanent annihilation is a limitless punishment. Yet, of course, Christ did not die an eternal death which is forever irreversible. He claims that forever irreversible penal non-existence is the essential nature of death, but you, it's difficult to see how Christ could have experienced that. Even if equivalence can be achieved on annihilationism, perhaps the temporary non-existence of Christ, given his limitless worth, is equivalent to the permanent non-existence of the sinner. Well, even if that might work, the problem still remains for the view. The death of Christ is of a fundamentally different nature than the death of sinners. Penal substitution. I can very quickly go through uh, a few more models here for the sake of time. Uh, the second model that I want to talk about with the atonement, which implies premise B, is the Christus Victor model, 
In it, the death and resurrection of Christ victoriously defeated and overcame the subjugating cosmic and spiritual forces that hold humanity in slavery. These powers uh, include or are described as death. In this model, our victory over death is made possible by Christ's victory over death. However, his victory was not an escape from or avoidance of death. It was fully taking on death, entering into it, and overcoming. If we take seriously the Christological truth that Christ was fully human, and we all do, the conclusion that his death was like that which is common to all humans seems nearly unavoidable. He took on the full consequences of sin, not in this model, the penal consequences, but the inevitable destination uh, for a person in a world infected with sin, which is death. The Christus Victor model supports premise B by entailing that Christ's death was like ours because he engaged in battle with death and emerged victorious. If his death was different than ours, how could this provide the victory for us over death? Christus Victor. Thirdly, the model of satisfaction warrants a few comments. In this model, God rightly requires total obedience from his creatures. But by sinning and failing to obey, sinners owe God a debt. Yet they are completely unable to make good or satisfy on their relationship with God because they still owe continued obedience in addition to the reparations for the dishonor done to God in their sinning. So merely resuming obedience doesn't make things good. Uh, the past wrongs are still unaddressed in the satisfaction model. Man should make good for the sins committed, but only God is in a position to do so. Thus, a God-man is the only solution to this dilemma, and only he could properly make satisfaction. This God-man voluntarily offers up his own death, which alone is of a sufficiently limitless value to rightly make reparations. It was given up freely. It's not a necessary consequence of sin. It was not already owed to God. Uh, and God himself offers it. And for all these reasons, it can pay the price. It can secure satisfaction. Now, given the incarnation's entailment that Jesus Christ was fully human, only a fully human death could be a possibility. And as we've seen, a fully human death is one like that which is common to all humanity. In this way, the satisfaction model supports premise B satisfaction. Now, for the sake of time, I won't drag you through various other atonement models, the governmental theory or the example model or other sorts of things. I think covering these three, I've probably covered most everyone in the room. Uh, and for the purpose of this paper, I think that's satisfactory. Uh, overall, the conclusion to be drawn from this section is that seemingly, premise B can only be denied if one also uh, rejects all of the major models of the atonement or modifies them substantially. Since it's not clear how one could do this consistently, or at the very least a case has not been put forth that is possible, I conclude that any acceptable view of the atonement will entail premise B, regardless of which model or combination of models you're using. So I'm sorry, I know that was a bit long to support premise B, but from the incarnation, it strongly seems to support premise B. From models of the atonement that we all hold, it strongly seems to support premise B as true. Now here, let me move on to uh, uh, perhaps a way you could reject premise B. Could it be rejected? Could it be that Christ's death was fundamentally different than that which is common to humanity? Well, I, as I suggested before, this Christological insistence upon his full humanity seems to preclude this possibility. Even if death was not due to him individually because he was sinless, it's difficult to see how any doctrine of the atonement could really succeed if his death was essentially unlike those he saves. Now, I thought about this and said, well, what, what move might someone be able to make? Perhaps the annihilationist could appeal to the general rev resurrection, or perhaps to the intermediate state, to get around problem B. And if you reject premise B, then my argument doesn't really work. So you could say something like this. Christ's death did not involve non-existence, but continued existence in the intermediate state before his resurrection. Maybe that could work. Regarding the general resurrection, with only a few exceptions, like Jehovah's Witnesses, do annihilationists hold that all who physically, with only a few exceptions, sorry, annihilationists all say that those who physically die will participate in the general resurrection. In other words, biological death is not the end of your story. Almost every conditionalist or annihilationist says that. In annihilationism, a more uncertain status befalls the doctrine of post-mortem, pre-resurrection conscious existence, the intermediate state. 
Uh, annihilationists are commonly agnostic or avoid mentioning the issue altogether. But a few do suggest that the intermediate state is non-existence, at least for the reprobate. While others affirm more continued existence of the reprobate in the intermediate state, leaving annihilation for the final judgment. Now, the recognition of these two doctrines, general resurrection and intermediate state, as important is really good. Uh, they both enjoy scriptural support. However, I don't see how these two doctrines can alleviate the problem that I'm raising for reasons I've got at before. Christ could not have experienced death in the sense of merely experiencing the intermediate state because that his, would make his death less than full. And because the intermediate state for the reprobate only exists in anticipation of the full realization of death in the final judgment. And for the annihilationist, that's non-existence. So if we could call it the negative intermediate state between physical death and resurrection, it's provisional, it's temporary. It really only exists because of other eschatological purposes and goals that God has. And so without those following annihilationist logic, physical death would be the occasion of total and permanent extinction. The intermediate state is only a part of the biblical, con sorry, the, the intermediate state is only a part of the biblical concept of death as is physical death. Now, neither in itself would constitute death enough, it seems to me, to be the fullness of death, to support the weight put on it by the demands of any doctrine of the atonement. And so, the annihilationist seems to resist premise B at the cost of uh, threatening every major model of the atonement and at the risk of making Christ's humanity, human nature, unacceptably like ours, in that it was not liable to a truly human death as they understand it, non-existence. So in the face of that sort of alternative, it seems to me we ought to accept premise B. I know that was a lot of work to get me there, but let's just say, moving on, that premise B is worth holding on to. Premise C is entailed by the conjunction of B and what A has to say. If you understand it, uh, uh, the fullness of death to be non-existence and Christ took on the fullness of death, uh, Christ ceased to exist. Now, many annihilationists recognize this entailment and, in fact, come out and say that Christ was annihilated. Atkinson, uh, Fudge, others as well. To reject premise C, perhaps the annihilationist might be able to make this move. Christ experienced physical death in something like the intermediate state, uh, but that experience of death was fully taken up on the cross in the process of dying. He did not at all experience death in all its fullness, which is the non-existence of annihilation or ceasing to exist. Uh, you could make that move, but as I've said, there is exegetical reason to think that this death light doesn't really work, and all of the major atonement models speak against it. So I suggest premise C stands. Premise D sets forth three logically possible options that follow from orthodox Christology. Christ is one person with two natures, divine and human. Now, presumably, the conditionalist would be unwilling to deny the Council of Chalcedon. Uh, I'll proceed on that assumption, but I'll return to it in just a bit. Edward Fudge attempts to avoid the, voice, the force of the argument by claiming agnosticism on point D and what follows from it, preferring to leave it in the realm of mystery. Although in the later revision of the fire that consumes, he does say that Christ suffered hell in his humanity. So I will later extrapolate on how Fudge responds to this argument, but for now it suffice to note that everyone recognizes that the options in D are valid. Those are your three options. And uh, almost everyone affirms E. You don't want to say E, so the problem then lies in, in premise F. But let me just briefly mention premise E. Premise E is very difficult to resist. The annihilationists cannot say that Christ's divine nature ceased to exist regardless of what happened with his human. To do so would, of course, create insurmountable problems. If Christ's divine nature ceased to exist, then God was bayoun for three days. The unacceptability of this implication is obvious. God cannot become a binity. Also, at the resurrection, the second member of the Trinity would then become a created being, which is, of course, unacceptable. It is nearly unimaginable that any conditionalist would posit the non-existence of a member of the Trinity, even temporarily. Seemingly, Christ's divine nature could only cease to exist if orthodoxy and the Trinity is denied and tritheism is affirmed, and even tritheism might not get you what you want. So given that that's a clear dead end, I'm not accusing anyone of that, I'm simply saying, obviously, we all should see that as a dead end. 
Premise E should stand. Well, then it comes down to premise F. But premise F seems hard to deny. As I explained from E, you sort of have to say that Christ's human nature, but not his divine, ceased to exist. But if that's true, then Chalcedon seems to have some problems. Chalcedon insists that once the incarnation begins, Christ's two natures are united in one person without confusion and without separation. In annihilationism, Christ's human nature ceases to exist. It just seems to me that that which does not exist cannot be united with anything, and thus the view seems to be positing a separation between the two natures. Now, you could deny Chalcedon and just totally walk away from it, but if you do that, then you sort of need to give a plausible and reasonable interpretation of the passages that Chalcedon is attempting to deal with. And that strikes me as giving an alternate explanation as a very daunting task. Many have tried and have failed. Now, perhaps the annihilationist might want to do something like this in order to retain the annihilationist view, but at least to me, that theological cost just seems a price tag too high. But there's another issue with premise F. Christ's human nature ceasing to exist for three days seems to amount to another incarnation, not a suspension then resumption of the incarnation. This is because it seems that diachronic human personal existence cannot be gappy. There can't be gaps in, in your diachronic human personal existence. Now, many of those who labor in the field of philosophy of religion have drawn this conclusion. Christian theists who are thinking philosophically about these things, with the exception of Trenton Merrick's, basically, everyone seems to think that this is the case. So even if you believe that you can sort of support personal identity with gappiness, you need to provide a convincing account of how this is not really the serious problem that it appears to be, and how personal identity can be maintained in such a scenario. If you cease to exist and then you resume after a period of time, how are you still the same person? It's a big question that needs to be answered if you're going to go down that road. Also, an explanation is needed as how the incarnation can really be one unified reality if it's literally undone for three days and then redone back together. How is this not two incarnations if Christ's human nature is ceases to exist and then it's recreated and rejoined with the divine nature? Now, Fudge has dismissed these objections as unimportant speculation, but I contend they're really anything but that. Turning Easter into a second Christmas is no small matter. Two final issues I want to mention with premise F, and I'm nearly done. Uh, first, the person of Jesus Christ depends upon the union of the divine logos and his human nature. If the human nature experienced an annihilation as death, then it would become difficult to see how a person, not merely a nature, died a death of non-existence on the cross. Second, if Christ's human nature were annihilated and thus separated from his divine nature, then his death would merely be a human death. This apparently creates major problems for the atonement, at least with penal substitution, but maybe others, since the death of a mere man cannot provide an efficacious atonement. Now, I submit to you, uh, respectfully, uh, that the argument I've presented here is valid, the points flaw, flow from each other, and rejecting any of these premises is more costly than holding on to the view, than rejecting the view of annihilationism itself. Uh, to wrap up what I have to say here, though, let me turn to Fudge's response to this issue, because I find it a little bit less than satisfactory. He provides five reasons that you ought to reject the argument I'm presenting here, and let me examine each one of those reasons in detail. His first reason is that the possibility of Jesus not being resurrec resurrected was a real one based on his prayer in Gethsemane. And as such, the traditionalist supposedly has the same problem raised by this argument. Jesus' human nature would have remained dead, which would undo Chalcedon. Yet, Fudge does not seem to appreciate that the traditionalist does not deny Chalcedon, that Christ's divine and human nature are never separated, not even in his death. This is because in his human nature, he died, but his human nature did not cease to exist. Of course, traditionalism does not consider the true meaning of death to be non-existence. That's the annihilationist view. The problem really only cuts if one assumes that death is extinction, and as such, it's not really an argument against traditionalism. Fudge's second reason more or less rehashes this a bit. He says that even the traditionalist, quote, weakened definition of death, end quote, means that Jesus' human nature was dead in some sense, here, here. 
The traditionalist, in fact, states that Jesus, in his human nature, experienced the fullness of death. But since the fullness of death does not require the extinction of the human nature, there is no problem of separating the divine and human natures in the person of Christ. Like the first, this reason doesn't quite seem to grasp something important that's happening here. Fudge's third reason is that this argument breaches the limitation of human wisdom. Since Fudge cannot reasonably be expected to explain matters that uninspired scripture leaves unexplained, such as the mechanics of the Incarnation, the details of Christ emptying himself, and how Christ became sin and became a curse in the Atonement, well, it's likewise unreasonable that Fudge could be expected to explain the mystery involved in the extinction of the Son of God that his view requires. Now, this defense is problematic in that it seems to confuse mystery with contradiction. Now, all sorts of views in Christian theology involve some degree of mystery on certain points, and that's not necessarily a problem for the view. But if a view entails a contradiction, then I suggest that's a huge problem for the view. Fudge seems to think that this problem I'm raising is the former, when really it's the latter. The internal contradiction rendering something false, that's a point of any exercise of reasoning. This is not some unacceptable import of rationalistic philosophy or some theological hubris or anything like that. Now, Fudge's fourth reason uh, sets aim at Robert Peterson himself. Fudge points out that the Council of Chalcedon was fallible, that any interpretation of the Council's statements is fallible, and that its, quote, language, after all, is highly technical and is 1,500 years old, end quote. He then accuses Peterson of going even further than Chalcedon in his argument. And I'll quote Fudge at length. He writes, uh, Peterson determines, using his own wisdom, the logical implications of my supposed view, then decides on his own authority that those implications are inconsistent with his interpretation of the Chalcedonian pronouncements, concluding that the implications that he draws from my exposition of scripture are inconsistent with the implications that he draws from the conclusions of the bishops of Chalcedon, he boldly tells the world that nothing less than orthodox Christology is at stake. Such authoritarianism and allegiance to human councils would be at home in a court of the Inquisition, but what place do they have in a discussion between Protestants and particularly between evangelicals? End quote. Now here I suggest we remember what I started with, interpretation and theology are inseparable. The theological task does not end with exegesis. There is no just pure reading of the Bible. That's just not how it works. The theological task ends when scripture interprets scripture and we develop theological coherence. Fudge must be careful not to dismiss any theological endeavor in just a few sentences. And let me be clear, his endeavor is very much a theological one. It's just not the case that his views are the straightforward and pure product of biblical exegesis, nothing more. While his opponent's views are contaminated by Greek philosophy, by blind creedalism, and by prideful confidence in human reasoning. That's just not a fair characterization. In the first four reasons, we have not yet seen Fudge really address this argument head on, and the fifth one he doesn't really get there either, unfortunately. In this reason, he essentially says that even though Peterson does not really know the implications of Chalcedon, if the implications of Chalcedon did in fact contradict some declaration of scripture, then we would be forced to abandon Chalcedon. Fudge seems to think that the choice is not really forced upon him, but if it were, then Chalcedon must go. Yet, I've suggested today that the, force, that the choice does seem to be forced on him in his view, and then we eagerly await engagement with this issue and refutation, not the sort of dismissal that I've seen in the literature thus far. It seems to me, anyway, that on the pains of inconsistency, the annihilationist has some serious problems with Chalcedonian Christology. To conclude... In this paper, I've raised what I think is a serious theological problem for annihilationism that remains unresolved. Now, perhaps there's an acceptable solution out there that hasn't really occurred to me that I've missed, but I've not yet encountered one. I've worked today to show that Christ's death was of the same essential nature as that which comes to man. If we couple this with the annihilationist understanding of death, it seems like there are major problems for Christology, and thus Chalcedonian orthodoxy seems to have some trouble. Now, I suggest that a view of eternal punishment with these implications should be abandoned and avoided long before Christological doctrines that flow straight to the heart of the Christian faith. Because remember, I don't think that the exegesis is nearly all that obvious as either side wants it to be. Thank you.
Thank you, Sean. Um, so I'm sure that a lot of you are just dying to ask questions, and we will have a little bit of time. Uh, but please understand that there is also the panel discussion tomorrow, and there will be more opportunities oh, to hear. Tonight? Sorry, tonight. Thank you. Um, hmm? Can you repeat your last two sentences? Well, they're off script, so I'll have to <laughs> wing it again. Uh, they're off script. They're off script, so I'll have to wing it again. Let me, sorry, let me get there. I suggest that such a view of eternal punishment should be abandoned and avoided long before Christi Christological doctrines that flow straight to the heart of the Christian faith. Because again, remember, I don't think that the exegesis is nearly as obvious as either side seems to suggest it is. And that's what doing theology amounts to. So we've got about 15 minutes. I'm going to take the microphone around. Let's be brief so everybody can get their thoughts and questions in. And uh, we're going to try to end here at about five to the hour or so, or five to the half hour, so we can make it to session three. So go ahead and raise your hand.